It's a dinosaur bicycle. We've seen Americans speaking for ISIS before, but never a child. The child saying he and his mother moved to Syria two years ago. NBC News has not verified the boy's identity, nationality, or whereabouts. So this is the story of an American family and a mother called Sam who left middle America and ended up at the heart of the ISIS caliphate. Sam says she was tricked into going by her husband, Musa. But what's the truth? They can believe whatever they want to believe, but they've never been put in a situation to make a decision like that. I kind of pieced it together over four very long years. And the more I dived into this story, the more stuff started to make no sense. And Sam seemingly revealed herself to be both villain and victim. My name is Josh Baker, and I'm an investigative journalist working in print, film, and audio. I was actually on another story whereby I was embedded with Iraqi Special Forces as they were trying to take the city of Mosul from ISIS. From the clearance of the east of the city to the west, the Iraqi forces have taken terrible casualties, but now they're finally closing in. And during that embed, I ended up getting caught in a suicide bombing, broke my back, but I was very lucky to get away. And I was back in London recovering, and I get this text from a contact who I hadn't heard from for a while. So about a week later, I'm sat in a hotel having tea and scones with this man, and he takes out his iPhone and hits play on a video. It's a home video of a young American boy called Matthew, who is in Raqqa, Syria, and he's trapped there and apparently he's looking for a way out. Now I sort of found myself in this weird parallel of having been, just lived through a suicide bombing and now seeing a young boy being forced to build a suicide belt. And I find out this video has been sent by Sam, the boy's mother, to her sister Laurie in the States. I'm like, okay, I need to authenticate this. So I get on a plane to South Bend, Indiana, finally get to Laurie's house and I'm sort of taken in, she's very warm, very welcoming. And we chat for a while and we get on and then she opens her laptop and brings up this email that she's had from Sam. As Laurie starts reading this email, she starts to break down. There are all sorts of like harrowing lines in there. Hey Laurie, I really hope you can help me. This could be my last time online. Almost every day, five to 10 bombs are dropped around us. The shock waves are insane. It rains shrapnel, everything from rocks to metal sheets to glass shards. And she signs the email off with, I love you, I miss you, I love you, I miss you. And Sam says in this email to show how desperate the situation is, she's attached two videos. One video is the video I'd seen in London. And then there's another video where in less than a minute, under the direction of his stepfather, Musa, who's got this very aggressive voice that you can hear in the background. He's being forced to take apart and reassemble a loaded AK-47. Now, this kid is about eight or nine years old, so they're shocking just to watch, but when you're watching it with a family member, it's a whole other level of harrowing. And Laurie is desperately trying to find a way to help her family. The United Nations called today for a humanitarian pause in fighting in Raqqa to allow civilians to escape the city. But it acknowledged that ISIS is attempting to use them as human shields, which could make escape impossible. The American government can't do anything. You know, the family are in the heart of the ISIS caliphate. They can't just send special forces in to get them. After I met Laurie, I then started trying to understand as much about Sam's life in America pre-ISIS, because I was like, how on earth does this girl from South Bend, Indiana, end up at the heart of the ISIS caliphate? Like, that just doesn't fit your stereotypical bill of a jihadist. You know, Sam is a tattooed, she's got lips tattooed onto her neck. She's, she's very, like, extrovert and looking. And I'd speak to friends, family, the works, trying to piece together her life. And I came across these home videos of what seemed to be a very happy, very financially successful family. You know, we're talking fast cars, uh, super bikes, a nice house. There's even one video which kind of broke my heart a little bit where you see Matthew being given a bike by Musa, the man who would later force him to assemble a suicide belt. In the meantime, 
through open source material, through contacts I have on the ground in Syria, I just get to work on mapping where the family might be, looking at Raqqa, looking at where the battle lines are, looking at where they could end up if they sort of escaped, looking where people who were escaping were ending up, in the hope that if they did make it out of this humongous battle, I'd have a head start on trying to find them. And it sort of went a little bit quiet until I literally land on a video which has just been put on Twitter and it shows an American family coming out of the ISIS caliphate in the back of a pickup truck and I'm staring at it and I'm like, that's Matthew and that's Sam. And so I'm suddenly like, oh wow, okay, so that they've escaped ISIS. And within a couple of days, I know exactly the compound they're in and I know who's holding them and I have the commander's name. So we head to Syria and typically I get there about two days after they've been moved. One night I'm sat in my hotel room about to go to sleep and I get a knock on the door and it's from a friend of mine who's working with me and he's just had a text and it's from a commander of a local militia. We've got no idea who this guy is. And he's like, I've heard you're looking for this American family. I explain what I'm doing. It's really interesting because he says, this person is a good woman and she's a victim here. And you need to understand that. And I'll just pause for a sec because the next time I see him a couple of months later, he tells me this woman is a snake and you can't trust her. About five, 10 minutes go by, door open. Matthew, this young boy I'd seen in this suicide bomb building video, walks in, his sister walks in, then Sam walks in. And I literally jaw drops and I have no idea what I'm gonna say. And I'm completely like stunned. Sorry. What? Sorry, how has this come about? I've been looking for you for seven months. The problem Shit. is, as I start talking to Sam for about 45 minutes, we're being listened to on every corner. They misunderstand a question and they suddenly think I'm trying to smuggle Sam out of Syria. I'm taken into another room and told I need to leave Syria. And then when I come back, I finally get to get her full account of what's going on. You happy for me to start? Yeah, let's do this. The second time I meet her, it's a very different Sam. Gold rings, slick back hair, baseball cap, puffer jacket. So Sam's account of how she ended up in Syria is that her relationship with her partner Musa had started to get a bit stale. They decide they need a change. And from friends I've spoken to, Sam was quite, it seems like subservient to Musa. He kind of drove the relationship. She did what he wanted a lot of the time. And the family decide they're gonna to move to Morocco, which is Musa's family home. On the way there, they have a layover in Istanbul. Turkey's obviously a country that borders Syria. Sam says she gets surprised by a surprise holiday by Musa. So they have this sort of 10 day holiday in Turkey. And all the while they're sort of moving from city to city and getting ever closer to the Syrian border. And she says one night when she thought they were going back to the airport, within a short while, this van slams to a halt, door flies open and there's a masked man there. Musa grabs her kids and goes out of the van. Sam doesn't know what's going on. She's like running after Musa as they run across this field and they're heading towards the border of Syria. Musa goes through a fence. Sam says she has no choice but to follow him if she wants her kids back. And she goes and she ends up spending more than two and a half years trapped in the ISIS caliphate. Did you know you were in Syria? Yeah, yeah, point? I knew I was in Syria. So when you are a newcomer to the ISIS caliphate, there's a couple of things that we know consistently happen. So women are typically taken to a madafa or a woman's house with their children. Meanwhile, Musa is off kind of having some form of military training. And after a couple of months in this madafa, Musa comes to collect her. The first time I see him is in the middle of Raqqa on the side of the street with a huge beard and carrying a gun. And I tell him, the first thing I say to him is, you're crazy and I'm leaving. He said with a big smile on his face, go ahead, you can try, but you won't make it. Along the way of this two and a half years. On his face, go ahead, you can tell him. The first thing I say to him is, you're crazy and I'm leaving. Huge beard and carrying a gun. And I tell him, the first thing I say to him Leo, comes to collect her. The first time I see him is in the middle of Raqqa on the side of the street with a huge beard and carrying a gun. And I tell him, the first thing I say to him is, you're crazy and I'm leaving. He said with a big, big smile on his face, go ahead, you can try, but you won't make it. Along the way of this two and a half years, Musa seemingly is getting more and more successful within ISIS's military wing, but also more and more extreme mm -hmm. and undoubtedly more and more abusive towards Sam and her kids. As time goes on, Sam says that she tries to escape or wants to escape. 
and somehow ISIS become aware of this. And she ends up in the Black Stadium. It's a notorious ISIS torture prison, for want of a better phrase. It's the old football stadium in the heart of the city, but it had these big underground sort of basement, gym area, things like that, which had been converted into a prison facility. Sam says she was taken there in the dead of night and subjected to severe torture. I've done my best to verify this. I've been there twice. I've found somebody within ISIS that says she was also held there. I know that it wasn't uncommon for Westerners or those who joined ISIS to end up in this facility. The methodologies of torture that Sam described that she experienced, I saw the implements in the rooms that she described. The layout kind of matches what she describes to me. Sam sort of comes out of prison and sort of sets about just trying to survive inside the caliphate. One day Musa decides, you're lonely, I want to get you some friends. Why don't we buy you a girl? Sam seems to think this is a good idea, and they go to a slave market. And Sam sees Suad, she feels desperately sorry for her, so she pleads with Musa to buy her. They buy Suad, Suad comes to live with Sam and the kids. Sam says she tries to make a nice room for Suad, and it seems to be true, I've seen pictures of this room. But ultimately, Suad and another girl that Musa also buys, end up being raped repeatedly for several years. So Sam has a complicity in that. There's no excusing that behavior. What's strange or possibly unexpected, they're immensely grateful to her. They see Sam as the rock that got them through life with ISIS and ultimately helped them escape. All the while, the battle for Raqqa is getting closer and closer. The coalition forces are squeezing the city and squeezing ISIS into an ever smaller pocket. Then really sadly, ISIS releases a propaganda video and it shows Matthew being forced to issue a threat to then President Trump. This battle is not gonna end in Raqqa or Mosul. It's gonna end in New Orleans. By the will of Allah, we will have victory. And he issues this threat and it goes global. By the will of Allah, we're gonna end in Raqqa. It's gonna end in New Orleans. By the will of Allah, we'll have victory. He issues this threat and it goes global. ISIS releasing a new video reportedly using a 10-year-old American boy. Today it used a young child for propaganda to threaten the US. So sort of during the death throes of the battle for Raqqa, Musa is killed allegedly in a drone strike buried under a building. After Raqqa, Sam, Matthew, his sister, and the children that she's ended up giving birth to while in Raqqa end up in this place called Derizor. And it's kind of where ISIS is making its last stand in Syria in terms of its caliphate. So over these very many hours that I'm interviewing Sam, we cover like a plethora of subjects. She tells me about these videos that I'd seen that had started this whole journey. You know, Matthew being forced to build a bomb, assemble an AK. But she leaves out that she was actually the person behind the camera, which completely changed the dynamic of how you understand her relationship to the person to build what? video, cover like a plethora of subjects. She tells me about these videos that I'd seen that had started this whole journey. You know, Matthew being forced to build a bomb, assemble an AK. But she leaves out that she was actually the person behind the camera. Shit! Which completely changed the dynamic of how you understand her relationship with her kids and the caliphate. America me. Perhaps one instance is that she's in an abusive relationship. She has no choice but to film this, otherwise she'll come to physical harm. Or maybe she's a willing participant. It's propaganda. It's the way it's meant to look. Sam touches down in a military base in Indiana where her kids are taken into care and she's arrested by the FBI. And about a month or two later, more charges came out against her. And the FBI alleged that she had knowingly and willingly traveled to Syria with her husband, and that she'd been part of a conspiracy to provide material support for terrorism. She ended up taking a plea deal with the FBI that would see her avoid a trial. Now, I think something like 95% of federal prosecutions end in that manner, so that's not unusual. But it also meant Sam avoided having to go through a lengthy thing where I think a lot of her lies would have been exposed. 
The judge sentenced her, and in his closing arguments, it was very interesting because for him, he felt conflicted. He felt like the charges that she'd agreed to carried with a sort of minimum sentence, but they didn't really give him the parameters of what he wanted for her sentencing. And he wrote in his closing remarks, there is no doubt in my mind that if it wasn't for the actions of your husband, you wouldn't be here today. So even the judge found it very hard to pin sole blame on Sam for this situation. That said, she is and was complicit in transporting her kids to a war zone where they would be subjected to unimaginable abuse and harm. And I think that's very hard to excuse, no matter what you think of Sam. You accept that the choices you made put your children through some of the worst experiences you could imagine for a child to have for years. I accept, I accept that I, I was unable to make the decisions to protect them better. I think the thing that I'm most proud of is it became a, what is now 12 or 13 part audio series called I'm Not A Monster, where we were able to really go into the depth and nuance of this story. Sam would be put into prison and that's where she is today. And the children have been able to be rehomed. So Matthew is back living with his biological father and I've spent a lot of time with him. What's the best thing about being home? Everything. Just everything. Like, there isn't the best part. He walked me through his account of what happened to him, talking me through everything he'd been through, being open about the things he didn't want to talk about happened to him. Everything. Thing about being home? Everything. Just everything. Like, there isn't the best part. He walked me through his account of what happened to him, talking me through everything he'd been through, being open about the things he didn't want to talk about. And at 13 years old, which is when I finally interviewed him, wanting people to understand that no matter how bad things get, there's always hope and you can always make it through. Patra, that is. <laughs>